Hi all, welcome to Smart Catalyst, 30th January 2019. Today we will be discussing these five topics. The first one is related with universal basic income. The second is related with India's recent entry into PISA framework of OECD. Third is related with the Supreme Court's question on RTI experts. Fourth one is related with National Clean Air Action Plan. The last one is related with organic food manufacturing in India. The first article is related with universal basic income. Uh, of late, we have been seeing uh, various government initiatives like uh, Raitu Bandhu scheme and Kalia scheme of uh, Telangana and Orissa government. And uh, these are one form of universal basic income being provided by the state governments. So we will uh, look into the basics of uh, universal basic income. So during the past week, newspapers have carried many news items on universal basic income. This may be attributed to the mentioning of universal basic income of a special kind by the various political leaders as a precursor to election manifestos. So based on this, uh, given these circumstances, it is essential for us to understand the basics of universal basic income. What is universal basic income? Universal basic income is a periodic unconditional cash transfer to every citizen in the country. During the provision of universal basic income, the social or economic positions of the individual are not considered by the state, whereas every citizen are considered to be equal person and they are provided with an unconditional cash transfer. So this concept of universal basic income has three important features. The first feature is that this is universal in nature and it is not targeted. We have this public distribution system that is uh, PDS and the PDS has got evolved into the targeted PDS in order to help the needy people alone and it is not universal in nature. But this uh, UBI is universal in nature as its name suggests. It reaches, it is not targeted, it reaches all citizens of a particular country. That is one important feature of UBI. And as we saw in the case of PDS, the government is subsidizing the cost of food grains and it is given in the form of kind to the people. Whereas in UBI, the transfer in involves cash and not any product or kind. First we saw UBI is universal in nature, then it is a cash transfer. Then the third important feature is that UBI is unconditional in nature. There is no social or economic condition that direct the flow of UBI. It is unconditional in nature. For example, uh, many of the European countries are offering unemployment allowance to its citizens who are unemployed. So there the particular person has to register in an unemployment office and uh, he has to prove that he is still unemployed. That is conditional cash transfer. Whereas here it is unconditional. No one has to prove that he is poor or he is unemployed. He is suffering from so and so disease in order to avail this UBI facility. So it is unconditional in nature. So we have uh, right from the time of our Indian independence, there have been many schemes and many programs, many plans have been undertaken to alleviate poverty. And poverty is a social disease that is uh, plaguing our Indian economy for decades together. So the one important uh, action to alleviate poverty is to provide social security to the poor people. And how this universal basic income is a working on to provide that social security to the people. When we get to understand this, we get to understand the importance of UBI in reducing the inequality existing in Indian society. So, Universal basic income as a form of social security, it helps in reducing inequality and eliminating poverty. Say for example, we have a person A and person B. Person A is earning 10,000 per month and person B is earning 5,000 per month. So there is existing an income inequality between these two people. The existing income inequality is 5,000. So uh, they both are living in a same society, they both are neighbors, so their daily expenses livelihood expenses are almost same but there is an existing income difference of 5000 for example if we are providing an additional cash transfer to the person b say for example the government is providing rupees 2000 as an ubi to person b then his disposable income becomes 7000 and now the income difference is reduced to 3000 by this way income inequality is reduced also, there is another inequality known as consumption inequality. Consumption inequality is a difference between the nature and quality of goods consumed by two different people. Say for example, since A is earning more, he would be consuming goods which have higher, uh, since A is earning more, he might be consuming more elite goods, whereas B is earning less, the consumption pattern will be different from A. There exists a consumption difference, consumption inequality for people belonging to a same society or belonging, uh, belonging to a same street. 
in order to avoid that if government is providing ubi the consumption pattern of b would increase thereby trying to reduce the consumption inequality by going this way also with higher income the instances of saving also becomes high so the poverty comes down by these ways universal basic income will help in reducing inequality and eliminating poverty in a society from human based industries we are embarking into a particular industrial era where the machines are going to rule the machines with artificial intelligence which is uh, given the name of industrial revolution 4.0 since machines are expected to take over the jobs of humans labor is substituted by technology there will be reduced wage income because people will be losing their employment people will be losing their jobs so the wage income gets reduced and since the wage income is getting reduced purchasing power also comes down low purchasing power indicates low aggregate demand low aggregate demand indicates low supply in the economy low supply is caused by low production so this replacing humans by machines by artificial intelligence would push us in a vicious cycle in order to support people financially in this uncertain future universal basic income is necessary there has been uh, arguments for and against universal basic income uh, economic survey 2016 has given a detailed analysis and explanation of uh, the arguments favoring and disfavoring ubi the crux of those arguments have been given in this infographics please refer as we discussed earlier right from the time of indian independence there has been many programs initiated by the governments to alleviate poverty and to reduce inequality existing in the indian society but uh, the almost all of these uh, programs have failed to succeed because of their universal approach to the problem and these plans having a universality approach they try to give carte blanche support to all sections of the society so in economic survey 2016 17 our chief economic advisor argued that you know any program in order to succeed has to shed its nature of universality so this ubi in order to succeed it should be targeting the bottom 75% of the population which is a majority of the population and hence it is known as quasi universality by nature since uh, going with ubi's uh, abbreviation we tend to think that it should be universal and even the definition of ubi says that it tends to be universal but in a vast and diverse country like india bringing in a universal scheme or universal project is going to be a gargantuan task there are few alternatives being suggested by the developmental economists let's have a look into that one of the arguments disfavoring ubi is that it induces more gender disparity in family income one thing is that when most of the indian families follow this patriarchal setup the expenditure of the family income lies with the senior male member of the family and this lopsided balance of ex- power of expenditure has led to gender disparity in spending provision of ubi enhances this gender disparity this is one argument disfavoring ubi rather the alternative proposed is to provide ubi by targeting women of the family since women are facing worse prospects in the cases of job opportunities education health and financial inclusion also a pilot project undertaken by a team of economists indicate that ubi for women can reduce the fiscal cost of providing the ubi itself the third alternative is to start with targeting vulnerable and marginalized people of the society like targeting widows pregnant mothers old and the infirm but if at all we are focusing only on these three alternative methods there are a very high probability of inducing exclusion errors and this violates the very basic foundation of ubi which means universal unconditional cash transfer to the public and this exclusion error are caused by discretionary decision making and this discretionary decision making would help in creeping in of corruption reducing efficiency apart from all this the very basic definition of ubi is violated these are the problem associated with implementation of alternative models of ubi what are the prevailing challenges in implementing ubi the first is lack of proper banking infrastructure in major part of indian territory as per the world bank report there are only 20 atms for 1 lakh adult population which is very very less in order to inculcate bank based financial expenditure practices among indian population 
there is already existing the majority of indian population is already lacking financial literacy digital literacy these both illiteracy has major role in pulling down the success of ubi this has to be focused and also physical infrastructure should be developed and the second roadblock is about the state of financial inclusion in india almost one third of the indian adults remain unbanked without and the even the citizens who are connected to the banks they also face problems of insufficient infrastructure so it would be difficult for the people to access their benefits if these lacunae are existing the last and the most important challenges in implementing ubi is how the government is going to finance the money how the government is going to source the money being provided to the citizens as universal basic income estimate by economist led by arvind subramanian they mentioned that in order to provide a near universal ubi to all citizens of india it takes 6.9 percentage of indian gdp already the government is spending almost 4.2 percentage of indian gdp on social sector schemes we all know that the fiscal deficit of the state and the central governments are been increasing due to the various expenditures incurred by the governments with already burgeoning uh, fiscal deficits providing or adding new burden like ubi would burn a hole in the executive of the country this has to be considered and this could become successful uh, this ubi will will be fiscally possible if the government is going to wave off or going to abolish the already existing social sector subsidies and replacing them with ubi but no government would be dare enough to abolish the existing social sector subsidies so uh, there are very high chances that if at all ubi is getting introduced it will act as an add on rather than being a replacing or substitute of social sector subsidies the major policy discourses are mainly hovering around this universal basic income and not on the universal basic capital discussing only about universal basic income is akin to providing people with fishes and not to train them to how to catch the fish so now the most plausible and most forward looking process would be to focus on universal basic capital this universal basic income is focusing only on the income level and it is not focusing on the poor working condition and the poor living conditions of the urban poor and the rural poor in the country of course these problems are caused by uncertain wages and the income inequality and these providing universal basic income would be a short term solution or a temporary solution as a policy makers the government should be focusing on providing long term and sustainable solution which is permanent so one of the most an unavoidable process unavoidable step towards clearing the fundamental problems plaguing the indian governance or the indian institutions is to strengthen the public safety justice basic education and health these four form the part of social capital and this universal basic capital concept is related with the development of social capital second administrative reforms commission it gave its recommendation in the year 2007 almost a decade has gone by and the recommendations of the second arc in increasing the state capacity has not been implemented fully so the government should be focusing on implementing the recommendations of second arc commission the income inequality or the variety is mainly existing between the people of belonging to blue collar and white collar most of the blue collar employees in the country they belong to msme enterprises and of them there are also few tiny enterprises which don't even come under this msme definition so their cries their problems are not unheard for are not represented for so we need to strengthen the middle level institution in order to aggregate the grievances of tiny enterprises and representation of the workers associated with those tiny enterprises by focusing on ubc rather than on ubi the government provides chances to its citizens to be the decision maker for their collective enterprises rather than the choice architecture is given uh, the government role is to build a positive choice architecture and by this nudging the public would be forced to choose a right decision even at dire circumstances that is the role of the government here the policy making should take this cue by providing proper choice architecture for the citizens the second article is related with india's entry in pisa pisa is a framework under oecd in order to assess the educational development in a particular country we will look into the advantages for india by entering into the pisa arrangement pisa 
is program for international student assessment pisa is under the aegis of oecd and the main aim of the pisa is to assess the skills and knowledge of 15 year old students in reading literacy mathematics and science and since it is being implemented by oecd major developing and developed countries of the world they accept pisa as a benchmark to assess the knowledge of students earlier india was under the ambit of pisa but after few years in the two year of 2008 india's ranking was done very badly and because of that india came out of this pisa arrangement now in 2019 the government has again decided to get into the framework of pisa in order to provide global benchmark for indian education system in this background world bank and oecd in the recent report has suggested that this move of indian government would help the young generation achieve success in the labor market because indian education system is going to be benchmarked against the best in the world as we discussed earlier the central government has decided that india would be participating in the pisa test organized by oecd from the year of 2020 thanks to the compulsory education uh, statutes and uh, constitutional amendment bill introduced by the governments of the first few years the quantitative development of indian education system has gone leaps and bounds but quality wise we still have uh, more distance to cover and subscribing to this pisa framework will help in gaining the global exposure to the indian education system also the indian education sector is huge and it is suffering from quality issues as i mentioned earlier and with a vast system regularly following up the quality of education in india has become a difficult task and it has become a bane for india's labor productivity even this recent scrapping of no detention policy under right to education act can also be attributed to the government's intent towards improving quality of education in the country now this initiative by the government would help us to gain global exposure and through this the evaluation system and curriculum design is going uh, will be gaining an impetus the report concludes in a positive note saying that india's investment in pisa is investment in today's younger generation for the future of the country Third article is why no experts on RTA panels ask Supreme Court and the Right Information Act has mandated that few experts have to be present in the RTA panel and the absence of the experts has made Supreme Court to question the government. We will be having a brief look into that news item. The Right Information Act 2006 mandates that the information panels should have few experts as members. but due to various factors the almost all the members of the panels are having bureaucratic background and this has made the supreme court to question the government and the act also mentions that people with range of experience from various fields should serve as information commissioners in a democratic country the citizens are entitled to know what the government is doing because article 19 of indian constitution has provided us with the freedom of speech and expression and in order to speak about something it is important for the people to know about that thing in order for the people to question the wrongs or question the mistakes being committed by the government it is important for the people to know the mistakes being committed by the government the same point has been reiterated by the allahabad high court in rajnarayan versus state of up in the year of 1976 saying that people can't speak unless they know and this gives a basis for article 19 and based on this right to information is important for people living in a democracy because questioning the existing rule questioning the extant rule is dissent dissent is the safety wall of democracy this right to information act acts as safety wall to protect indian democracy and the objective of this right to information act is to empower citizens providing transparency and accountability in governance which has prevention and elimination of corruption and uh, as per the right information act 2005 there has to be a chief information commission established by the government so a uh, chief information commission was established in the year 2005 and it is headed by the chief information commissioner and the, the general superintendents of the functioning of rti act is being undertaken by the chief information commissioner the chief information commissioner and the chief information commission they hear appeal from the information seeker who are not satisfied by the public authority there are apart from the chief information commissioner at the central level there have been various state information commissions set up at each state and the supreme court has recently found that 
identify the flaw that the members shortlisted for these information commissions all over the country they comprise mainly of people from bureaucratic background so since uh, rti act is providing impetus to article 19 of indian constitution it becomes more important and more crucial for the government to safeguard the sanctity of this institution expert members independent members should be provided space provided membership in the panel in order to improve the proper functioning of right to information act 2005 the next article is related with national clean air action plan under national clean air action plan the government had planned to introduce a mitigation adaptation plan for cities which have not achieved a reduction of pollutant level based on national air quality index and of them another 139 cities are not being included in under the ncap we will look into that the global ngo greenpeace has recently launched a report titled apocalypse 3 under this report the greenpeace has mentioned that uh, around 139 highly polluted cities are not included in the government's national clean air program we all know that national clean air program is uh, initiative launched by the central government and to mitigate to monitor to disseminate data and to induce public participation related with air pollution the main aim of this uh, plan the main aim of the scheme is to reduce the particulate matter pollution by 20 to 30 percentage in 100 to select cities by the year 2024 the most important governance uh, innovation in the scheme is that it takes information it takes feedback it involves the functioning of all three levels of governance in the country be from center state and the local governments it has also space for citizen participation so this uh, scheme of the government seems to be more promising uh, the apocalypse report of greenpeace has found some shortfalls in the government scheme the report analyzed around 313 indian cities and of those cities 241 cities which is almost 77 percentage of the total cities being analyzed they have recorded more than the allowed levels of pm10 pollution of the total 241 cities which have recorded highest pollution only 102 cities have been taken under consideration for ncap and the other 139 cities are not being left out this is because and for calculating for ncap scheme the government is considering only data till the year 2015 and this scheme has undertaken the data till 2017 the report has raised an important concern important issue that even if government is uh, possible to reduce the pollution level of pm particulate matter by 20 to 30 percentage by the year of 2024 around 153 cities will be still lurking and the dangerous marks of particulate matter pollution so it is uh, the government has taken a right step forward by implementing this ncap in 102 cities uh, the government has to think on the possible repercussions of missing out the remaining cities and uh, up to date data has to be used in order to choose the cities to implement this ncap the last article is related with government's tightening of norms around organic food manufacturers who are not adhering to the norms with increasing awareness about the pesticide pollution in the food products being consumed by the consumers with the changing diet patterns of the millennial youngsters in all over the country the more focus is given towards the organic food products and uh, many food business operators that is fpos involved in this organic food business they are violating the norms stipulated by the government under this food safety standard regulation 2017 so the fss ai the apex body to oversee food safety in india had given a new directive that from the april 2019 all organic food products in india would carry jaivik bharat logo that is organic logo the retail shops or the local kirana shops in the neighborhood can be tracked easily but this e-commerce websites with the increasing prevalence of e-commerce website stipulating and conditioning stipulating the rules becomes more tough so in order to avoid that the government has proposed to tighten the noose around organic food manufacturers under the jaivik bharat initiative the government has spoken about two systems of certification the one is the participatory guarantee system this participatory guarantee system is under the ambit of ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare the second certification system is under the national program for organic production this is more focused on export and value addition of the agri products and hence it is falling under the ministry of 
commerce and industry. So the government is uh, moving in the right direction. With the recently introduced agri export policy of India, which targets at improving, at in which targets at increasing the agricultural uh, export of India from 30 billion US dollars to 60 billion US dollars, it is important for India to focus more on organic products. Thank you.